and came back tonight just to be a part of it. They've been here several nights, so it's been good to be in God's house and have some friends here. And how, you know, how I introduce all these guys is my friends, and they're all my friends in different ways and, and different places of life. Um, but this guy tonight, uh, first of all, i got to tell a little something about Dan because he knew that I was bringing Wayne in last night. Wayne was a trip, right? I mean, Wayne was just, he was a trip. Well, Dan knows Wayne pretty good, and, uh, and he found out that Wayne was speaking Monday night, and he said, why on earth would you put me after the human firecracker? <laughs> I said, well, it is what it is. But let me tell you something. I, I, I specifically have all these guys where they need to be. I, be, I believe the Lord has led us to that. And, and the, the deal is we want every person that, that comes to, to preach at this pulpit to be themselves. And that's the, that's the freedom that I want people to have. And so when Dan comes tonight, Dan ain't Wayne, and I don't want Dan to be Wayne. Dan ain't Justin. Justin's here with us tonight. I don't want him to be Justin. I want Dan to be Dan, and I believe he has a specific word for this church tonight that will, that will stir us. Because let me just tell you something about preaching. Preaching is more than a style, and I think sometimes we get attached to a style. You know, worship, it's not a style. We get attached to a style. What we need to listen to is the substance, and I believe that Dan has substance tonight to bring to this church. So if you would, would you stand to your feet? Welcome my friend, Pastor Dan Lord. God bless you tonight. Oh, you can be seated. God bless you. Wow. Get to be here at North Bend Church. Y'all are famous. Do y'all know you're famous? Hello in the back. I've been working on my Wayne wave all day. We talk about you. You're the talk of the nation. You may not know that. Your pastors are part of a movement in the earth called Team Church and uh, C3 and other movements of pastors. And your church is talked about. You're influential. And you may say, I don't know about that. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think this was a great church to be a part of. And I'm here because of the reputation that your church has well beyond this region in West Virginia. One of the things I wanted to make sure I said tonight is, is that something great can come from a small town. I know last night there was some poking about, you know, Wayne coming all the way from Big Apple, New York. And I get it, I get it. I pastor a church, and one, one location is a town of 5,000, and two years ago we opened a second location 22 minutes away in another town of 5,000. So I get it. I know this town's 1,000, 900. <laughs> we need to know Jesus came out of a town of Nazareth, and they asked the same question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And the answer, according to the Bible, is yes. <laughs> Just a little friendly reminder that something great is coming out of this region, of this church. most beautiful building in the whole town is your church. You got something to be proud of, not just your building, but your pastors. And uh, I love your pastors. They're hard not to love. They're sincere, God-loving people. They love people. They love West Virginia. They love guns. <laughs> your pastor put a double-barrel shotgun Double trigger, double barrel shotgun in my hands today. I tried to pull both triggers at once. It was not good for this boy. I chipped my teeth. The gun came up into my mouth. I said, I don't think I got both triggers. What gauge was that shotgun? I learned today that the gauge, the smaller the number, the bigger the, the gun. I've learned some things with your pastor here in West Virginia. So we're having fun. We're having fun. It's great to meet their children, amazing world-class leader children. What's what, running in mom and dad is, or walking in mom and dad's running in the kids. You can feel it. You can sense it. And walked in last night, came early. I wanted to hear the preacher. I wanted to be here and came in last night, saw the teenagers over here, the student section. I was like, the student section. I got real excited about the teenagers starting to save seats. I came in today, and I saw a Bible and a notebook on one of the chairs. I was like, wow, we got students coming early to reserve seats. Someone said, that's the youth pastor's Bible. Come on. 
It's just awesome. Youth group, youth group building, I can't say enough about all that I'm seeing that God's doing here, being here in person, and I'm just thankful for the opportunity. I love your pastors. Their hearts are gold. And uh, I said to your mom tonight, Holly, I said, I see where your daughter gets the fire from. <laughs> it's awesome. Beautiful to see the whole family and how their believing in you has birthed this. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for believing in your kids. It makes a difference. Somebody, somebody believes in you, it, it matters. There's an old saying that's many people have done more than they thought they could because someone else thought they could. I'm thinking of some of those people in my life, just thinking about the stories I've heard from them about you, and so you're to be honored. Come on, can we thank Mom and Dad for <laughs> believing in their kids when not... There wasn't everybody here believing. It's pretty, pretty special, pretty special. I, I bring greetings from my family, my wife, and uh, we've got five kids. People say, do you like your kids? I, I like my wife. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, last night we had all those Google searches, so I figured I can say whatever I want tonight. That's my wife, Paige, uh, the in there, and she has not aged. She's 29. I'm 50. And uh, that's Tate, the tallest girl there. She's Tate the Great. She's 20. He's doing great in college. And Super Cooper, he's in the back. He's, he's the president of his student council in the high school. Senior, it's awesome. Super Cooper. Cooper. And that's Kenley Joy Joy in the green. She plays keyboard, leads worship. She's an artist. She's amazing. And then we've got Graham the Man in the middle. He's named after Dr. Billy Graham. Isn't that cool? I want to name him Billy. My wife was like, no. I was like, how about Graham? That worked. And then the little one there, she's the above and beyond what God could, gives you more than you can ask or imagine. That's our fifth and final <laughs> child. We're waiting on grandkids now. Anybody waiting on grandkids? You're done having them for yourself, and now you're like, bring on the grandkids. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. So I've got a message that I want to speak to you tonight. Uh, but before I do, I, I feel like during worship, that was powerful, by the way. Don't you think your pastor should lead worship more? Yeah. Just wondering if you thought what I thought. I thought that was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but while we were in worship right there at the end, there's some people praying in the front, and God just quickened a verse to my heart and my mind. And it's a question that God asked in Psalm 94. And I, I felt like the Lord said to me, Tell the people I heard them tonight. I heard you. That has nothing to do with my message, but it's a message from the Lord. For somebody in this room tonight, the Lord wants you to know he heard you. And Psalm 94 asks the question, does he who made the ear not hear? No, he hears. How could you make an ear? Come up with the ear. Is this like Elon Musk is cool. But God figured out how to make ears. And put them on your head. He even had one cut off in front of him, picked it up and put it back on a guy's head a second time. Talk about miracle ear. <laughs> Can't buy that at late night television. <laughs> Peter, don't cut off any more ears. So when the psalmist asked the question, does he who formed the ear not hear you? No, he hears you. There's a couple of you that were desperate tonight. I could see it. I could sense it in the Lord. He responds to that kind of faith. And I just want to encourage you, he hears you tonight. Can we just thank God that he hears us tonight? He hears us when we pray. It's not just words. It's like a good dad. I feel like I'm supposed to sit on this. He's a good dad. He listens. I get distracted. My kids are talking. Dad, dad. What? I get distracted. I get bothered. Get into a football game. Any dads, be honest. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you can scream at me. I don't care. The Chiefs are on. I'm, tr I'm zoned in, you know. But he's not like that. He, he hears us when we call him. He's a good, good father. Good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. Okay, I'm not a worship leader. <laughs> that didn't work. All right, on to the message. On to the message. Y'all ready to receive tonight? Come on, the hungry get fed. Only the hungry people get fed in the kingdom of God. You're not hungry. You're like, ah, we'll see. I'll let you know if the pot pie is good or not. 
and then it probably won't be good. But if you come in hungry, how many know when you're hungry, a piece of bread and butter, it tastes good when you're hungry. A biscuit's real good, even without butter when you're hungry. Come on, anybody hungry tonight? Well, I want to talk about, I want to talk about one of the greatest attributes that's found on successful teams, happy marriages. You, I, would, I, could, I could say you won't find a happy home, a happy marriage without this quality. I'd say that within any church that I see that is on the move, impacting the world for Jesus Christ, any church that I've been to, anybody I'm friends with and I have an idea about their church, you find this quality there if they're actually making a difference in their community. How many of you want to be a part of that kind of church, right? You want, we want to be part of an impact-making church. One of the questions we ask in our church is if we closed our doors, would anyone in the community care? If the answer is no, then we should go ahead and shut down, sell the assets. So I want, I want to have a church that has impact. And the church, by the way, is the people. Remember the little song? Open the door, see all the people. It's the people of God. It's never a building. So what quality, what attribute am I talking about? I'm talking about this, having a willing spirit or a volunteer spirit. Does Pastor Jason Holly need more people to volunteer? Did they ask him to preach on being a volunteer? No, they didn't. They didn't. That's not what tonight's all about. It's about a willing spirit. How many of you ever had a child that you were asking them to do something like, Johnny, I need you to sit down in that chair over there. And Johnny sat down in that chair. But with his face, he said, I might be sitting down with my body, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Have you ever obeyed God like that? Like, fine, Lord, I'll tithe. That's a dirty word, God. But I'll do it. I'll give this offering. No, no. He says, the offering? You give a gift? It's not based on the amount. It's based on the heart condition that brought the gift. It's not the number that makes the gift acceptable. It's the willingness to bring the gift without your arm twisted behind your back. And he says, the scriptures say, if, if the heart is willing, the gift is acceptable, not according to what one has, but a, a, according to what you brought from a willing heart. How many of you ever gotten a little card from a kid? It wasn't even Hallmark. It didn't cost $6. You can hardly read the chicken scratch little kid handwriting. But there's a little heart in there, and it says, love you. And you're like, this is the most expensive card I've ever got. I'm keeping this forever. I got a bunch of those. Anybody keep all their kids' cards? My wife hates me for that. I keep them. Why? Because it's so valuable. It's precious because it came from a heart that was willing and was happy to make the card. Didn't have to go get a birthday card. How many of you know the people that go to Dollar General? Like, I gotta go, go, go get something. Gotta go to Dollar General. We gotta go over to Jenny's birthday. You get a card, they half signed it, didn't even lick it. <laughs> Give you a little gift bag and the tissue paper's not even, and it's like, got you something. They walk away, and you're like, well, thanks for coming to my birthday party. You can feel it versus someone that's like, hey, I got you something. When they're bringing it with a willing heart, a happy heart, a cheerful heart, they can't wait to be a blessing. It's not about what it is. Are y'all tracking with me? I'm trying to describe what that willing heart it feels like. And Isaiah talks about Isaiah chapter 1, first chapter of Isaiah, verse 19 and 20 says, this is our text tonight. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. I want the best of the land. I want the steak in the house of God. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land from the land. But look at this. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <laughs> I love when the Bible comes alive like that. As if we didn't know who spoke, now we know whose mouth it came from. That's pretty serious. You will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let's talk about this. Let's put this up on the screen. The blessing of God comes into our lives by these two ways. Number one, our willing spirit, or we could say our attitude, a willing spirit or our attitude. I want God to bless my life. Everybody would raise their hand. Yes, I, Dan, I want the blessings of God. Yes, yes, yes. How does it come? When I have a willing attitude. Second way it comes into our life, he shows us in this verse, 
is through our follow through, our, our obedience. If you're willing and obedient, it comes through our obedience. Everybody say obey. It's not a cuss word. Four letter word, yes. But God's not just looking for a willing spirit. He also wants the follow through. I've had it happen to me so many times. I've tried to get better at it to shorten the time from when God speaks to when I follow through. And the longer the gap grows in my life, the less likely I am to actually do what God told me to do. Tonight God spoke to me. I said, I need a pen. Because if I don't write it down, I'm probably going to forget. Like, like, for example, think about, have you ever heard about someone that wasn't doing well? Someone sick, maybe in the hospital. Some, a, a, a lady that's lost her husband or something. You think, I need to call her. I need to write them a note. You know, talk, you know what I'm talking about? We should take some food over to their house. And then you don't do it right. Then you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do that tomorrow. And then, and then two, no, 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 no. next thing it's Sunday morning and you see them in the lobby. Four or five days went by and you're like, I, how, how, I was, I was going to come. How are you doing? And what happens? We miss our opportunity because we don't obey all the way and right away with a great attitude. And what God's looking for is he's looking for that willing spirit, but he's also looking for the follow through that quickly comes with the willingness. Amen? Can I get an amen? I know I'm not Wayne, just act like it tonight. <laughs> you see, where you, where you find a willing spirit, you find an environment that's cheerful and happy. You, you could go to one restaurant, everybody's excited to work there and serve people and they, they wanna be the best restaurant in town. You go to another restaurant and nobody, they don't really wanna be there and they're there for a paycheck. They're not, they're not really there to serve because they wanna serve, they have to have a job to pay their bills and so, what can I get you? Well, how about a smile? Come on, are y'all tracking with me? You can, you can feel it. I, I want to be in a willing spirit kind of environment because that, that environment is happy. It's encouraging. It's a positive environment. I've had two kinds of coaches in my life. I've had negative coaches. Get off your bleep and bleep and bleep. And you guys bleep and bleep. And then I've got other coaches like, you're doing great. You guys are champions. We're going to win this thing. I know which one I want to be in. The life-giving, encouraging environment. What kind of church are we building? What kind of worship services are we happy, having? Does pastor have to prime the pump every week? Come on, everybody, let's worship. Come on, everybody, let's worship. No, we want to be like David. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to house. I can't wait to get to God's house. I'm not going to fight for the back row. I'm going to get to the front row. I, I, I can't wait. I'm excited. That's that willingness. It's just kind of flowing. What I've seen in life and in, in leadership especially is we kind of have levels of Levels of willingness. It was like eagerness. Come on, how many know when you're eager? That's good. You're eager. That means I'm excited. I'm ready to do whatever Jesus is asking of me. I take things on. I initiate saying yes. I look for opportunities. I'm eager to serve. I'm eager to do what God wants. Then there's compliant. I do what I'm told to do. Well, you didn't ask me. Compliant says, well, you didn't ask me to take the trash out. I know, but it's overflowing, Charlie. Well, but that's not in my job description. <laughs> We're starting to go down, aren't we? Compliant. How many of you know this person I'm talking about? Don't point at him right now. <laughs> then we go down another level, defiant. I'm not really interested anymore in serving the Lord, serving people. I make things difficult now for other team members, and I've become disagreeable. And then the lowest level is rebellious. I'm just hostile towards my leadership, be that God or a person or a pastor, a boss. I've become poisonous to the health of the environment. Somewhere between defiant and rebellious, we, we, we need to get you some help. Maybe tonight you came in and you're kind of, you're struggling with the little rebel in you. We all have a little rebel in, we don't, in us, don't we? My church is redneck country. Like, if you have to go to the county to ask for a permit to build your shed, that, you might as well, like, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a bad day if you have to force somebody in my county to go get a permit. Our county believes it is our biblical right to not talk to the government about anything. <laughs> I, I live, I pass, <laughs> y'all like that too. Like, 
The inspector said he doesn't like how the plumbing pipes are. Who is he? He's the building inspector. And we got this little rebel inside. And my church, it runs deep. It's like, we don't, want, we don't want anybody to tell us where to sit in church. Bless God if the pastor should close off the back row for moms with babies to slip in and out. Like, well, I like the back row. Who is he to tell me? He's the pastor. We've had fights in my church over ropes in the sections. Last time I checked, the dad of the house gets to tell the kids where they're sitting at the dinner table. Is that on? <laughs> Can you all hear me out there tonight? Is it working? Or My kids don't say I'm going to eat in my bedroom. I'll say, you're going to eat where you're told to eat. Woo! Get, Pastor, am I going to get to come back? I know Wayne want to come back. I'd like to come back to you. Okay, anyhow, okay. We'll move off that one. But we do need to address, we need to address the little rebel that's inside all of us. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and unless we die to ourselves, we've got to get on that altar every day, take up our cross, deny ourselves. It's not what Dan wants all the time. Can I get an amen? amen. If you're a leader in this church, I want to talk to you. I don't want to just encourage you as general church. I want to speak to you as leaders. If you serve in this church in any capacity, if someone looks up to you, you lead a group, you're a leader in youth group, you serve in children's ministry or outreach, whatever it might be, greed or cleaning the building, this verse of scripture is for you tonight. First Peter 5, and it's a, it's a serious verse. It's a little bit of a heavy verse. He says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. So I'm talking to you. I volunteer in my church. I serve the Lord willingly. No one makes me. And so I'm coming to you like, let's talk eye to eye. But then he, he reminds them of, he's not just a fellow elder, but he says, what I'm about to tell you, I'm telling you, after I saw what Jesus went through, since I witnessed what Jesus went through for you, I, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're same, but I also was a witness to Christ's suffering, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. So he says, in that context, I say, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them, not because you must, or some versions say, not because you have to, but because you are what? Say it with me, willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but say this one with me, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you. I'm the boss, I'm the leader, no but by being examples to the flock. And look at this, when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So the chief shepherd is not only the chief shepherd he's gonna give the reward, he's also the lamb of God who laid down his life, how willingly laid down his life. Jesus said, when people say, oh, you know, the, they, the Romans, they murdered Jesus, they crucified him, Jesus would he would absolutely contradict that and say, they did not murder me. No one took my life. I laid my life down. No one can have my life. I gave up my life. I laid down like a lamb led to the slaughter. They led me off to die. They didn't utter another word. I didn't fight them. I didn't protest. I could have zapped them with lightning bolts. Romans didn't kill. Yeah, they were the instruments of wickedness that God used. But Jesus didn't fight them. He willingly laid down his life. And so he says, in view of, of my eyewitness to watching him not put up a fight. Like I was there when they beat it in his head. I was there when they said, if you're the king of the Jews, then do something about this when they mocked him. I was there when he said, mom, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. I saw it all happen. I saw the earthquake. I watched it all happen. And in view of this, I say to you, don't be a leader because you have to. Please. I, I can hear he's like, please. He didn't do it because he had to. So please, at North Bend, don't do it because you have to. The world will be able to tell. And you'll cancel the love that Jesus had for everybody if you start doing it because you have to. See, the love of Jesus, it's authentic. 
Like we get baseball hats and there's that silver sticker on there. Why do we like that sticker? We keep the sticker because it lets everybody know it's not fake from China. It's not from China. <laughs> it's authentic. This is like real, authentic. The world's asking, is this love that we're giving out, is it real or not? I've had, had, had a situation just a couple weeks ago. A young guy in our church brought a friend from college. He said his friend was so freaked out. He's never seen people so happy, and he just didn't know if it was real. He's not sure. He might come back, but he's not sure because he's never seen anything like it. The world is asking, is this really real what we're doing? And when we, when we serve the Lord with a willing spirit, then people see it. Amen? We're not trying to prove anything to the world. We're just trying to love Jesus and follow him and you ever seen anybody that's been in a car wreck and they get their neck brace on? They got a stiff neck, huh? Y'all seen some stiff neck people? Have you ever had a stiff neck and tried to act like you didn't? Right? You come to church and people are like, how you doing, Dan? And you're like, I'm fine. It's whole body turns, you know? Your arms kind of get longer, you know? Yes. Like, is your neck hurting? No. Why would you say such a thing? You know? Here's, here's what I could tell you. When you're a stiff-necked, hard-to-lead person, everybody can tell, and you're the only person that thinks people don't know. And we think we're hiding it. Husband, your wife knows. You're not really following the Lord the way you should, and you're rebellious towards God, and you're not treating her the way that you should, and it's captain obvious to her. If you would just humble yourself to the Lord's authority and be more willing to serve the Lord, the Lord would bless your marriage. She can tell. Wife, you thought you girls were getting off on that one. You're like, we're getting off easy. Pastor got the guys. Get them. Oh, I like this pastor. <laughs> Ladies, when you're not respecting the way you should, your husband can tell. But when two people love each other with the love of Jesus, not because they have to, well, I have to cook him, I have to cook some food, I have to do this for her. All she does. Uh, no, no. When we willingly serve one another, the marriage prospers. Amen? I hope I'm helping you tonight. Let's not be stiff-necked. That, that word is mentioned again and again in the Bible. Maybe it's not your favorite Bible verse. I, I haven't seen anyone stiff-necked Bible verses tattooed on their arms yet. Maybe after tonight. Exodus 32, verse 9. I've seen these. I've seen these people. They got big foam pad around their neck, the Lord said to Moses. And they are what? They are a stiff-necked people. Jeremiah 20, uh, 17, 23, yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and wouldn't listen or respond to discipline. They were stiff-necked. That means to be stubborn, to be rigid, inflex inflexible, harsh, strict, stern, opposed to, hostile. Those are not the fruits of the Spirit, are they? Now we're going to see the voice of the Lord speak again. Proverbs 29, verse 1, whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes Aren't you thankful the Lord is long-suffering? Yeah, but there's going to come a time he's like, I'm done suffering. And after many chances, I'm going to give you chances. It says you'll suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Where's this term come from in the Bible? It's a farming agricultural term. And they used to have long sticks. They didn't, they didn't always have a, a bit and a bridle. And, but they'd have long sticks, a goad. And when the oxen were plowing the field... The farmer could walk behind them, and on the end of the little, like a bam, imagine bamboo, long piece of bamboo, lightweight, with a little rock, or like an Indian rock point on the end of it, and, and he would poke the oxen to get them to go left. And he could kind of tap them a little bit, and then sometimes, how I many know if you got an arrowhead going into your butt, you're going to listen? <laughs> That's what this is. And the Bible is called the animal a stiff necked animal because when the farmer's trying to lead it, it wouldn't listen. It wouldn't turn its neck to go where the farmer was trying to lead him. That's the term. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, another heavy piece of scripture is where Stephen is being, he's been put in the execution chamber. And he's about to be stoned to death. And he's preaching. He's not backing down. And he says to him things like, 
you uncircumcised, stiff-necked people. <laughs> How many know that's not a compliment? You're in a leader's meeting. All the, what's your uh, small groups called here at church? Small groups, hey. <laughs> I guessed right. Put me on Jeopardy. I'm ready. That buzzer. What is small groups? Yes, 200. Imagine we're having a small group leaders meeting and someone turns to you and says, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised person. But look at this. He's not talking about having a physical change. He's saying your heart hasn't been changed. You didn't let your heart get baptized. And so he, the Bible says he falls, falls to his knees and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Does that sound like someone else? And then he fell on his knees. He cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. God saved him. But his accusation that got him murdered was you're stiff-necked. You're just like your fathers. You resisted the Holy Spirit. You can't be led by God. You're stuck in a rut. I know that's a little heavy, <laughs> but it's sobering. It's easy. I'm 50. It's easy to get stuck in ruts. We get our routines, we get our ways of doing things. Isn't it easy? I mean, let's be real, right? It's easy to get like, well, this is how it's going to be, and this is how church should be, and this, you know, I, I do enough for God. Well, when did, when did we get to stop, start telling God that we're doing enough for him? He gave his life. When did we get to start telling God no? I, I didn't know. My pastors haven't taught me that scripture. No, when the Lord asks us to do something, when he's speaking to us. Come on, I pray that this church, amazing church, but your best days are not behind you. They're in front of you. And you unless we lose our yes. When it was time to build the first building, 20 people, some people filled out forms to say, we will tithe and you can count on us, bank. You hear that story? What, what happens five years from now when people aren't willing to, I'm not willing to make a commitment for the next thing God wants to do. What will happen is the church will die. You see how big this is? A willing spirit. And God didn't want that to happen. He wants us, the more people that will get that willing spirit, his church can move on like nothing else. I'll give you one more great illustration. Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9. This is how God wants to lead us. It's a beautiful, beautiful mental picture. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will guide you with my what? My eye. Let's pause right there. Does anybody remember when your mom was looking at you and you were at Bob Evans and you were having too much fun with your friends? And across the table... She looked at you with death stare. And you're like, I think I'm going to heaven tonight. <laughs> what was mom doing? She was doing this scripture right here. I will guide you with my eye. Then you get in the car. She said, I told you to be quiet. And you're like, I didn't hear anything. Oh, I told you with my eyes. <laughs> we know. Did you know the first thing babies do? They lock in with their mom's eyes. They can lock, they lock in and they begin to learn about the world around them. They learn everything's safe in mom's eyes. You're going to be okay in mom's eyes. The father is saying to us, I don't want to boss you around. I want to be able to just look at you and you know, oh, not over here. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. Let's not, let's, let's not do that. No, let's not do that. I won't do that anymore. Good idea, God. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's a lot easier to parent when all you have to do is give a little look. All the parents are like, I'm taking this home. I'm going to start teaching eye lessons. <laughs> the next part, he says, don't be like the horse or like the mule, which have not some understanding. Look, the horse and the mule, now they have no understanding. The dumbest horse you've ever had. This horse and mule have to be harnessed with a bit and a bridle else they will not come near you. God's saying, don't be like the mule. I've got a 
bit in a bridle here. Y'all didn't know I was a horse expert. Thank you to the Lyles family for bringing up the bit and bridle. Come on, give a big thanks, shout out, help the pastor out. I know it just looks like a really ugly dog leash, but it's not. You can take a, well, I don't know this, I should ask. What's the average horse weigh? 1,200 pounds. Is that Mrs. Lyles? Oh, you're just someone smart on the third row. Thank you for that. Another horse person. So think about that. You can take this piece of equipment, you put this part over their long nose, you put this piece of metal in between our teeth. Then you hook this up to the reins and you sit on that 1,200 pound animal. And an eight year old can sit up there and go, huh. How many know if you have a piece of metal in your teeth attached to a rope with someone behind you, you're going to do what they want too? How do we get the 1,200 pound animal to do what the eight year old wants? But God says, no, no, no. I don't want to do that with you. I want to do freedom training. I want to take off the bit and the bridle. Did you know there's a real cool thing in horseback riding? It's called freedom training. And now there's a movement where people, they don't start with the bit and the bridle with the horse. They go out and just spend time talking with the horse, walking with the horse petting on the horse. They get to know the horse. They develop a trust and a bond. They get so close that they eventually get on the horse and mount it. And with their voice and with little movements of the leg and the way they squeeze the horse, they can ride the horse without a piece of metal in its mouth. And that's what God says right here. This is the way I want to lead you. I want to lead you with my eye. I want to lead you with a, hey, I want to lead you with a, Right, 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 right. Watch out. And you'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Some of us, though, we've lost our yes. We've lost our willing spirit. If we were to be honest, you could recall a season in your life where you had it. Some of you, I know this with a crowd this big. <laughs> Some of you used to be the people for kids' ministry. It, like, you loved kids and you loved serving kids and now you're like, well, I'm 44 now. Somebody else's turn. Said who? There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. Where's that in the Bible? Did it turn off again? <laughs> Retirement's not in the kingdom of God. It's not in there. You know what we need in our churches? We need more grandmas. We need more grandpas serving in kids' ministry, blessing children, encouraging children, speaking life into children. Grandma and grandpa, I'm calling you back. Well, I used to do it when I had babies. Well, come on back and get some more. I've got people in my church that will tell me, yeah, I used to do all that. And I'm like, what happened? When did it become okay to take a time out from serving the Lord, for making a difference for people? Well, we used to have youth group over to our house. Well, let's do it again. But the church built a building. I know that they, they, they like that building. But if you invite them over to their house and you got 10 or 15, you know, boys over there and you fed them a bunch of food, they'd like that better. Come on, are you all tracking with me? Some of us need to get back our yes for serving the Lord, following him in his ways. Some of us that's saying yes to God again, to serve in his house again. We, we, we took a break during COVID and we never came back. Well, I'm just in a season of healing. Okay, well, why don't you serve and get healed? Your pastor just laughed. I think he must agree. I probably wasn't supposed to tell you he laughed, but I heard it up here. Would you stand to your feet with me tonight? One more verse I want to share with you, and then we're going to pray. Psalm 51. Why is Pastor Dan telling me I need to serve when I, I feel like I need a break, a long break? David, after he had sinned and messed everything up, he prayed this prayer. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. To sustain me. You see, the strength that we are often searching for, the strength that we need is hidden in the attitude of our willing heart. 
He didn't say just, you know, give me back my kingship and my reputation. He said, no, give me a willing spirit to sustain me. You see, sustained strength for serving the Lord and others comes through a willing heart. He says it. Give me that willing spirit to sustain me. I can tell you this. No one in my church picked me to be a pastor in 2024 when I was a kid or a teen, rebellious teenager to be here in West Virginia encouraging you in the Lord. Actually, I had a principal that told me, she said, Dan, if God doesn't get a hold of you, you'll grow up to murder people in cold blood and won't even care about it. Well, thank you, Christian school principal. But you know what? I wasn't the smartest C student. I wasn't the brightest. I wasn't the one that was picked to be the next pastor of the church I grew up in. Overlooked. Tonight I fumbled through my notes trying to get through scriptures. Can't, can't read so good. Didn't read out loud in school until eighth grade. But I will tell you this. I've been willing. I used to sing, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. I kept showing up to clean. I kept showing up to help. Go help the single mom move. My pastor got me my own dolly from Sam's with air tires because I was helping so many people move. I have young people that tell me, I want to be a pastor like you. Okay, well, good. Go get your own dolly and start helping all the solo moms in our community. Just be willing and God can do something through your life. If you're willing, just, just bring out what you have. Bring in the two loaves. Bring in the fish. Just bring in what you have. Just show up to, like, I'm here. What can I do? I love the youth group. that I, They're all here early. Like, that's awesome. I, I want to encourage the teenagers. Just look, when it's youth group night, get here as early as you can. And wear your youth pastor out. What can I do? Because it's not called a youth pastor or youth group. It's called a youth group. Get involved. Take over kids' ministry. I, I, the one thing I was missing tonight was teenagers on the platform. I would be like, um, Pastor Dan said we could take over the worship team. <laughs> Just stay willing, young people, and God will do awesome things through your life. I will, I'm believing, God, that you're going to take over the church in Jesus' name. There's going to be a youth revolution that hasn't happened yet. We got the building for it, but it's coming in Jesus' name because young people are willing to say yes to Jesus. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to open up the altars tonight. Pastor's going to come, and the team, they're going to lead us, and we're going to sing, worship God. But I felt like tonight God said, give the people an opportunity to come to me and say, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation and give me that willing spirit to sustain me. God, less of me, more of you. So tonight, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. And if God's dealing with your heart, I want you just to have a chance to come and kneel before him tonight and do some business with God. How I many know we need to get on the operating table sometimes, let God do some heart surgery and not be in a hurry? There were times I stayed at church for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, Went and found another little place. Tonight's that kind of night. It might be your night to just like, I gotta get a hold of God. I gotta get back. I gotta get my heart right. I gotta let God have me again. He used to have me, but I gotta get back. I gotta get on the altar. If that's you tonight, don't worry. Don't worry about anything else. If you rode with somebody, it would be their great honor to wait for you tonight and let God touch your heart. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. In view of everything you went through for us, Lord Jesus. Help us to get our yes back, God, to have a willing spirit like you did for us. Grant us, Lord, a willing spirit to sustain us. In Jesus' name, amen. The altars are open. God bless you. Come on, let's willingly lift our hands tonight to the Lord. Let's let the Lord do what he wants to do in this place. Come on, let's lift it up. So I throw up my hands. Praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not much. I've nothing else fit for a king except for heart singing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So I throw up my hands, I praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Oh, we lift our voice. Lord. Oh, 
you so much for this word tonight. So clear, so precise, delivered in a way that every single person in the room can understand. We think sometimes it takes so many things to be used by you, so many giftings or talents or abilities. But Lord, you use those who are willing. You use those who will obey. You use those who will be led by your spirit. And Lord God, how desperately we need your spirit. How desperately we need your presence in our life. We need you in, in our services, God. We, we need you in these moments, but God, we need you outside of these moments. We need you outside of these walls, outside of these doors. God, we ask tonight that you would just begin to lead us fresh and new. And God, sometimes we, we just need to lean in. You're always speaking, but we just need to lean in to hear what you're saying. God, may we lean in tonight. May we le- willingly lean in to what you're saying to us, what you're speaking to us. Lord, we love your presence because in a room like this, you can be speaking uniquely to so many people. You can be speaking uniquely to individuals. Maybe things that we've forgotten about for some time. Maybe maybe things that, that God, you laid on our heart years ago and we, we, thought, we thought maybe we wasn't good enough or we, we couldn't do it. We couldn't be sustained in it. We, we didn't have what it took, but Lord, tonight you're bringing those things back to us. And I, I believe you're speaking that to someone tonight, that, that you're stirring in us something new, something fresh. Maybe for others, it, it, this, is a, this is a fresh thing. This is a new thing. And you've maybe never experienced God in a way like this. Maybe you've never seen God move in a service like this before, but you've been drawn by it. You've been touched by it. And you say, I want more of that. And I just want to encourage you to lean in, lean into God, lean into the spirit of God in your life. And, Get in God's house. Get plugged in. Serve. God, may we realize that what we do here does not just affect us in this moment, but it affects generations to come. And if there's a theme, if there's a thread that we have heard in this space in the next, or the, the past couple of days, it is that, God, you are, you are for the next generation and you are using the next generation. And, God, this is not just for us. It's not just a space where we get to come. But, God, this is a space that we are building, God, for the next generation to hear the gospel message, the only message that can change, the only message that can save, the only message that can heal, the only message that can restore. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else is momentary. Everything else is temporary. But God, the gospel message of Jesus Christ changes us radically for eternity. And Lord, we thank you for that message in this house. And we pray that God, every time we come in this space, first and foremost, we would praise you, but we would realize our praise, it affects the generations to come. It affects the generations to come. God, we pray for our young people in the building. Night one, Lord, they were all across the front. What incredible, what an incredible sight to see. People under 20, all across the front, from one side of the sanctuary to the other. It was an amazing thing to see. And God, I know just for me personally, it just it spoke to me so deeply that we are building something that will last beyond ourselves. This is not a movement of a personality, and this is not a movement of, of, of a one-man show or, 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 or few people with gifts or talents. No, this is a move of the Spirit in your people, the church, because it is not a person that has remained on the earth. It is the church that has remained on the earth. And so, God, may we get that, that this space, this place, these these people, it outlasts us. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Lord, we give you praise tonight. We give you honor. We give you glory. You're so very good. And it's been so very good to be in your presence in this house. We will never cease to give you all the praise that you're deserving of. Jesus, it's in your mighty name we pray and we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. And the church shouted, amen. Amen. Well, it's been good. It's been good. I'm filled. Uh, I'm encouraged, and I'm excited for Sunday. And, and I just want to tell you something. I love what Dan said tonight. He said he, God, 
fills those who are, who are hungry. Th- those who are hungry, he fills. And you're like, man, this was great, and this was awesome. I, lo- I love North Bend Nights. I can't wait till next year. Guess what? We meet again in a few days. Amen. We meet again in a few days, and every moment that we step into this house can be a moment of life change for someone and for anyone who is willing. Someone and anyone who's willing and hungry to say, God, do what you want to do in this space. So, man, I think the church has been built. I think this theme strengthened has been incredible. The church has been strengthened in this place, and it's been a great, great time. So can we put our hands together for Pastor Dan and I? Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Love you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close doing this. Um, thank a kid's church worker because we went a little over. Thank them. Hey, we appreciate your time, your energy, your effort. You can sign up to help them as well. So you could do that. I, that's what Dan said. I didn't say it. Dan said it. I'm just telling you what Dan said. But we're going to pray for Pastor Dan and Grace Life Chapel and the work they're doing there. So let's stretch our hands toward Pastor Dan. Let's pray for him. Lord, we thank you so much for what you're doing through Grace Life Chapel. Uh, and, Lord, through, through Pastor Dan and through their whole team and their whole ministry. And we know that's a team. Lord, it's such a unique thing that you're doing with them. And I thank you for, for the heart that comes from Pastor Dan to, to encourage his team that, hey, this is, it's all of us building the church together. And I thank you so much for his humility. I thank you so much for his obedience and, and just what you've done and what you're doing. The greatest days are ahead of him and that church. The greatest days are ahead of Grace Life Chapel. And, God, we speak that over him tonight. We thank you for that and what you're doing. God, I just pray for a special strength and a special grace, a peace that comes only from you. That is the only thing that can sustain us. And we pray that that would sustain him and his wife and his family and their church. We thank you. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. That's all we got. We love you.